Well, thanks, Haley. Hi, everyone. Um, I love these conferences. The, uh, you, can, you can see an industry developing as, as it's talked out, and hopefully we'll be, we'll be part of that conversation. And it flows on very nicely from the, from the last session. Uh, my name is Paul Chatterton. I lead the Landscape Finance Lab, which is a little organisation helping to incubate and get finance into landscapes. But really what we're here to talk about is the world of, of tech innovation and how that lands on the ground and how that connects up with, with financiers. Um, a friend, of, friend told me he went to a conference in Stockholm recently called about the polycrisis. And I thought that was a, that was a very interesting, interesting term. We're facing this many crises all coming at once. And that demands solutions that can, pro that can produce multiple results at once as well. We, we no longer have the luxury to focus on just single, single actions that produce single results. We have to be grouping things together. So what we're going to be looking at is how we group together the world of carbon with the emerging world of biodiversity assessments, how that works on the ground and how it connects with, with financiers, there's been a carbon revolution. You'll see that it, it looks like there's a biodiversity revolution coming, and we'll go deeply into the, into the technology of that. Um, but how do we link these, these pieces together, the data, the metrics, the money, <coughs> and the meaning? That's the critical question. How do we make it meaningful pe for people on the ground as well as for the bankers on their, on their screens? Um, so we'll be looking at cutting-edge technologies in eDNA, Earth observation, um, and, and how to invest in that. Okay, enough from me. I'll ask my friends to introduce themselves to you, and we've got a couple of pretty pictures to go along with it as well. Murray. Right, uh, great to be here. Good to see some familiar faces and uh, great to see some new faces as well. Um, my name is Murray Collins. I'm the uh, CEO and one of the co-founders of a company called Space Intelligence. Um, my own background is 17 odd years uh, walking around tropical forests, uh, measuring them on the ground and, uh, and from space. Uh, and what we do is uh, integrate different types of data, so synthetic aperture radar, optical data, LIDAR data, to produce above ground uh, biomass estimates to support um, projects, as well as land cover maps and historical change estimates to provide baselines. And we're doing that for individual project developers, uh, nation states, so going up to 100 millions, uh, hundreds of millions of hectares um, being mapped. Uh, and we focus in particular in the, in the tropics, so it's really on that supply side, supporting the origination, development and the monitoring of projects uh, that we do, really at that intersection of the AI, uh, forest ecology and big data from satellites. So that's really where we focus. Now 25 people based up in Edinburgh, um, but as my own background, wandering around tropical forests and being chased by tigers and elephants, I'm really passionate about biodiversity conservation, so really thrilled to be here with uh, People are so forward thinking about the technology, but also the financial instruments which could be brought to bear on this parallel crisis. Murray has a couple of cool slides. Can we get those up on the screen? There we go. Yeah, so I, I got, so this, this is just a, a cover with some of the, um, the highlights. So we've published a, amongst our senior team over 100 scientific papers, which you can find on uh, Google Scholar about how we do this, how we relate uh, sparse measurements in the field about forest properties to our satellite data, which allows us to scale up and produce consistent and accurate estimates of forest properties. Um, and we're working across some 15 different countries. I'll show you quickly the, um, the forest biomass map if you click to the next stage. Before you do, have you seen a Raphaelisia? I have, yes. It was in slight stages of decay out in, uh, in Sumatra, and it did smell quite poorly, yes. The biggest, stinkiest flower on Earth. Biggest, stinkiest flower in the world. <laughs> so that's what we're trying to conserve. And, and this is an example of one of the products which we create. So Lola had that enviable, fascinating uh, global presentation, which pips this, unfortunately, um, of global estimates of forest height. But what we do is zoom down to the detail, the project or landscape level, to produce these kind of maps, so where we've got per pixel estimates of a 
above ground biomass. But these um, models that we create, the regional models, are fully calibrated and validated with field level data. So not only do you get the map, which supports the uh, validation and verification of a project, but you also get the uncertainty estimate. And so our progressive <coughs> R&D is the reduction of the uncertainties in those maps, but also then thinking about how do we support things like biodiversity conservation. So that's, I think that's my, that's my intro pitch. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Stephanie. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Stephanie Kaiser. I'm the sector head for nature-based solutions, carbon markets, and forestry for Nature Metrics. You might have seen our cuddly toys outside, and please come and speak to us. An easy we are, trick. So. Yes, I know it's a marketing trick. Um, we're a tech company based in Guildford in the UK. I'm personally also based in Edinburgh, same as uh, Mary here. Um, we are a team, an amazing team of up I think we're more than 130 people now. Um, most of us have a PhD in biology. I myself am a trained biologist, have worked mainly in the forestry sector as well as in impact investing in carbon forestry. And I was very excited to hear the panel this morning at nine o'clock when especially Victor, who's former South Pole, talked about the need for direct biodiversity data and the fact that we're still a bit stuck at the moment because all of you have said amazing things about how we need to create these market mechanisms, how we need to get biodiversity onto our balance sheets, how we need to get biodiversity layers into our platforms, our digital, digital platforms. But do we have those data and how do we get, how do we turn nature into data? And that's the challenge that we've tackled at Nature Metrics, and we're using the power of environmental DNA. It's a bit like crime scene investigation. So we have these very, or we can't really see, we've got these very simple kits here for collection of water samples. When we collect water samples, we extract the eDNA of all these organisms that have passed through the water or have been close to the water. We can give you lists of species from uh, in the marine sector, whales, uh, other, like, any kinds of animals, basically, in the marine sector. And also in forestry, from rivers, we can give you information on all these vertebrates that might be IUCN listed and might have a very big impact on your um, biodiversity and uh, carbon credit value as well. And then it has also been... Um, other people have mentioned the importance of starting to look at the soil microbiome. So from soil samples, we can characterize the biodiversity in your soil, which is essential for restoration projects to track the success. And also we work with insects, which is essential for especially the agri-space. Thanks, Stephanie. And having been involved in biodiversity surveys for 30 years, this is really groundbreaking, I've got to say. Yes. Julian. Yeah, thanks. Uh, my name is uh, Julian Ekelhof. I'm from Forlions. I'm the Senior Director for Climate Solutions. Um, I've been with Forlions for almost 12 years now and still haven't managed to even uh, be part of it for half of the journey we've, we've been through. So when we started this more than two decades ago, uh, working on nature-based solutions, um, what we know today, for example, in the carbon markets, in terms of the certification standards, the methodologies, the market ecosystems, that didn't really exist yet, right? So you talked about we see the market developing. So over the last two decades, it took us to get where we are today, and certainly not uh, even now, not yet at the finish line in terms of carbon markets and those ecosystems. So I think that is really interesting to see the parallels now in, in the discussions we're having here. Um, so um, what we do is basically three different focus areas. So we work on uh, first and foremost project development, uh, working with, um, with our local partners to implement projects, um, completely nature-based focus that, um, that um, work towards impacts on climate action, on biodiversity, on livelihoods. Um, and then secondly, we work with the corporate side who are supporting these projects. Um, on their climate strategies, but of course also on, on selecting the right projects and, and understanding the impacts they are achieving. And that's the third part actually that we are focusing on, and that is a lot of the focus these days, how do we connect those two sides really in a mutually beneficial mm -hmm. way, right? So it's not just about generating the finance, but it's really understanding how they interact and translating the market perspective uh, to the project development, and then on the other side for the investors to really help them understand what are the impacts and what are the realities in the projects and what that, does that mean for how I support these projects, how I select projects and also how I can, in a very, very targeted way, help improve these projects because it's not static. It's not there is the project and it's just about understanding what's happening, but it's also about 
continuously improving what's going on. Mm, the practical application. Yeah. And Stuart, we, we've met you earlier, but uh, you've got your feet on the ground and your head in the clouds. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, tell, I'll tell you how I got here. Yeah. Um, so by background, um, a long time ago, I was an investment banker, and I spent, 20, to show how, how old I am, I spent 23 years doing that at Lehman Brothers and UBS, and that's when I started going gray. Um, the, the worry lines have come on in my second career, uh, which is in sustainable finance, and I've been focusing on this since 2004, um, both as an advisor, but also as a principal, as an investor in, in projects. Um, I, as you know, I'm a trustee of Botanic Gardens Conservation International, which is science. I'm also um, a senior advisor to the Climate Bonds Initiative and have been for many years now. And Paul and I have worked on a couple of projects together there. Um, really looking to scale capital markets uh, for sustainability. Um, but my, my, my true love and my, 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 my entire, almost my entire professional focus or, or non, my work focus is on uh, my project which I helped set up um, and co-founded in 2008 which is Green Gold Forestry in Peru. Um, I'm going to, it's always easier talking to some photographs. So we're in northeast Peru. You'll see the yellow arrow there. Um, and interestingly, on my map on my desk, you can actually see where we are. We are Peru's largest owner of production forest concessions. Um, we just um, acquired two companies last week. Uh, we're now at 336,000 hectares. Um, and we're looking to expand a little bit further. Um, but the, and our business model is that we take uh, forest, production forest concessions which are, are destined to be logged. I should emphasize not clear felled, but selectively logged. And we transition those into conservation concessions where there's no logging at all. And for doing that, we, we of course, <coughs> earn carbon. And about seven tenths of our carbon yield is avoided release of carbon. And about three tenths is sequestration or removals from the atmosphere. Because those that, that's nature doing its job, which is um, trees that would have been cut down actually continuing to absorb carbon dioxide. Um, we are going through our verification process right now. Um, our remote sensing company is on the end of the uh, panel over here, Space Intelligence. And I'll show you on the next slide, not, not quite yet, what we're doing with them. Uh, but we're going to be earning around about half a million tonnes on average of carbon, uh, carbon dioxide emission reductions a year uh, for the next 20 years. And as we have now grown our land holdings, we, we expect to have a second project which will increase that. The reason I've, I put these, these pictures up on this slide is to show you, uh, to re-emphasize, previous slide, re-emphasize yep. um, that community is really at the heart of what we do. Mm. So when you say, what do you do, Green Gold, <coughs> in Peru? Well, actually, 80% <coughs> of our time is spent on working with communities and creating alternative livelihoods. If we fail in this, we're going to fail in conservation. Um, interestingly, the picture on the left-hand side at the bottom is a fruit which grows in our forest. We have about 7,000 hectares of surveyed, in other words, we've gone our inventories into this, um, swamp forest. And there's a lot of fruit grain there, including acai, which you can buy if you're in the UK at Waitrose. Um, and this fruit, which is harvested here, which is called aguahi. And we got an order for the oil produced from this fruit in, into Korea. What we're worried about is over-harvesting. So we are going to be using bioacoustic sampling techniques to look at, mm. sorry to say, at, at, at our, um, our net impact on that. The next slide, uh, and I'm finishing now, is just showing you what we do in the forest itself. Here we are calibrating those remote sensing uh, measurements which uh, Murray has described. Um, and that we have, um, quite a, uh, we have 30 plots in our forest which we have measured uh, fully. We also, I should add, as a, for a former forestry company, we have uh, maybe tens of thousands of hectares of inventories of trees in our forest as well. So we have a lot of biodiversity data at our fingertips, and we just want to make sure that it's intact. Thanks, thanks, Stuart. So we've got four people, organizations working closely together already. We'll to go a bit deeper into what they're doing, but then we'll come back and look at what is this world that's emerging between us all? We want you to be part of that, so be ready, ready with your questions. Stuart, when we were developing those land use criteria for climate, the Climate Bonds Initiative, which now influence $1.3 trillion of investment worldwide, 
We, we didn't think of biodiversity metrics. It was far too complicated then. But what are you seeing now in the investment world? What's the interest for, the, for this? So the first thing to point out is I think it's just obvious to nearly everybody in the world that biodiversity is important. Mm. But it hasn't been something that companies and asset managers and banks until very recently have been asked to report against. Um, and as a consequence of that, um, and also as a consequence of uh, lack of regulation, I'd say, at a local level in many, many countries, we are suffering a, a nature crisis. But things are changing. So two things which are happening right now. We have the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosures. will next year have a, uh, a tool which corporations can report their biodiversity impacts through. The second thing is that banks, in particular, are being asked by their regulators, certainly here in Europe, by the ECB, the European Central Bank, to report biodiversity risk in their physical risk categories. So when, they, when they're regulated, they have to report their risks. So biodiversity risk is now um, on the radar of the European Central Bank. So we see corporations and asset managers and banks with an issue. And actually, I would... I, I can tell you actually almost for sure that no bank, no asset manager, no corporation is properly measuring its biodiversity impact. And that's the opportunity for the technologies we're discussing this afternoon mm. and also for interactions, financial interactions in the marketplace, which I think will stimulate conservation at very large scale. Yep. And the bankers are asking for biodiversity credits that don't quite exist yet, but uh, we'll, we'll, well explore Well, most, most that bankers further. haven't been trained in biology either. No, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Murray, you're leading, I mean, it's cutting edge what you guys are doing in Earth observation, and you've just been in Silicon Valley and Houston getting even more sharp and cutting edge. Uh, what are you finding there? And uh, tell us a little bit about what... Well, that, was, that was slightly off piece. I was invited over to the celebration of the uh, Go to the Moon speech of JFK in, uh, in Houston. So I was with uh, Lola's colleagues uh, from, from NASA, actually, who are planning lunar and Martian missions, so a bit more out there. But the good news is that, that a lot of that energy and that technology which gets developed spurs development in technologies which we can then turn into Earth observation. Mm. Uh, and there's a whole host of new satellites which will be uh, coming forward, which are really, really exciting. So uh, things like the Biomass mission, uh, which is a, a global mission at P-band uh, SAR sensor, which is going to really help us understand uh, patterns of biomass around the world. But um, I think there really there's a, a huge amount of data which is out there uh, already. So yes, technology is really, really exciting. Technology development will just be endless. I think I'm a technological optimist, but I think we should take a break and think about what's sufficient. So this is why this is such mm -hmm. an exciting panel. Like, yep. How much information do we need before we start the action? So um, whilst I am a technologist, I, would, I mean, that's a question I would like to pose particularly to, to Stuart, is what is sufficient amount of information that we can bring from eDNA sampling and from the remote sensing such that we can spur this revolution and drive the finance? So loads of new technologies out there. Thanks very much to NASA for things like the, the JEDI mission, which is absolutely fundamental in understanding the structure of tropical forests and hence the biomass and hence the, the carbon stocks. But let's focus on what we need to be able to make this happen. And how to make it dead simple so those people in, in the villages in Peru can use it just as easily as the, as the bankers. Um, Stephanie. I know from working 30 years in a conservation organisation, if, if you get three conservationists around the room, you've got three ways of measuring biodiversity. It's a, it's a disaster, but you guys are coming up with the solution. It's, it's really... I, I get very excited about what you're doing. Can you tell, tell everyone else a, a little bit more about how this works and, uh, and why it is so revolutionary? Exactly. As Murray just said, and also <coughs> Stuart, we really need the data at scale. And remote sensing is obviously great at that. But um, some other panelists have also mentioned that we need the, the data from the ground, right? So we can't do that as we've been doing it uh, until now, just sort of in an anecdotal or descriptive way, right? So. I will give you an example from the Peruvian Amazon and WWF Peru. They asked us to find information on six or detect six crucial species along 1,000 kilometers of river in the Peruvian Amazon. That is a very large landscape. So if you imagine sending the biologists out, okay, so we're talking here about six species that can be very different. They were all um, mam uh, 
aquatic and semi-aquatic species and some terrestrials as well. So you would need almost like a different ecologist potentially for the different ones because they have different ecological um, um, characteristics. Then it would take you a very, very long time to detect them and actually also be confident that you have detected enough of them. How will you be confident that you have detected enough of them? And because we're feeding these data into markets, comparing them with remote sensing, we need to have good and robust data. So what we did then is um, we took three trips right, uh, on a boat and we took samples along these 1,000 kilometers of river. We took four replicates in each point, I think about every four kilometers, and we didn't need any ecologists. We didn't have to fly in anyone from the US or from Europe. We can use the local um, workforce. That means you can also involve your local communities. You can save costs there. And then in this case, this was a fairly simple, fairly broad coverage um, project that we ran there. We just used one genetic assay that picks up all vertebrates. So we're talking mammals, amphibians, fish, etc. So at the end, they picked up the six species they wanted. So they had the tick box, which is really important for their reporting, for their funding, which will also be the same for you people who need that for your market mechanisms, but interestingly, with the same genetic test in, this, in the lab, there was one process, we got another 675 vertebrate species with one test, as in one test in the different locations. Wow. So just imagine what you would have to do otherwise to pick up all these different species. It's impossible. Yeah. And I worked in carbon forestry in the past, and it was really that lack of data that was holding back um, that process towards actually integrating biodiversity in a meaningful way. Another example is all of you people here who are doing restoration projects, and you want, you're ask, people come to us and say, how can we track restoration? We want to do it, how do we do it? So we've got a team, we're almost like a think tank as well, we've got a dedicated team that looks at how can we give you the best sampling designs on the ground to make sure that you get data that has the right granularity that feeds in to your frameworks. So we figured that part out as well. And in that case, we would use soil biodiversity, which is not something you can do with any other method. And we can give you a characterization, like a fingerprint, of your soil, for example, at the start and at the end of a restoration journey, so you can track how your soil is changing, which in the future will give you a lot of information um, about you, the resilience of your land-based projects. And that will be key for risk mitigation of your... And that's even assets. more a game changer, isn't it? Because yes. soil quality is also about soil biodiversity, but we've not been able to measure that until now. That's going to be super powerful for the, the world of agriculture. Yes, we've just opened a new sector within Nature Metrics. We are split in sectors, extractives, infrastructure, marine, water, nature-based solutions, finance, and now regenerative agriculture, just responding to an incredible demand we yeah. had, um, not only from portfolio managers, but also from estates on the ground. So Julian, you have to make it work on the ground. Is this making the world more complicated for you or, or easier? <laughs> Well, <laughs> if it's done by great organizations like the one who are sitting here, I think it's making it easier. But, um, yeah. And we had a few of those discussions in the past, right? So it is really the difficult part for us has always been, and we see that, for example, in the certifications that have always existed and what you were uh, describing as well. It's, it's one thing that there are strong standards with the methodologies and it's... it's, it's maybe for us here, it's very clear, like, how do you need to assess high conservation values and so on? but for the ones who will in the end actually need to implement monitoring plans, who will need to collect the data and who will need to work on the project on the ground, if they are starting their first projects, they don't really know, even if they hear the words, they don't really know what, is, what am I supposed to be assessing, right? And I think that is even more relevant when we talk about now investor KPIs and from that perspective looking in, how can we generate this data and which tools can we use, but do the, uh, do the, the projects locally like, how do we translate it for them, right? So what is it that we are really looking for uh, in order to generate the finance? So in that sense, to answer your question, at first it makes it much more difficult because then you don't have, okay, you, you, these are the five steps you should take to monitor, but mm. these are the 50 options you have, and you need to figure out the four or five ones that are actually relevant and most applicable for your project, right? So 
what we try to do is that we work more also in the direction of, of platforms and dashboards where we can take the different tools and take individual tools and try to integrate them into something um, where you have this broader toolbox and can, can pick and choose the ones that work for the project mm. and where they also see the results. And I think that is really, really important for on the community level that they see what is the result of what we are collecting here, how is it used, and how can we use that also to feed back into the project development and improve what we're doing on the ground and then next time it's even more species, right? And I think that's where it gets interesting. That is interesting because it forces us to make choices about what we focus on. It also means that transparently we have to decide what our objectives are and do that with the community. Mm -hmm. Stuart, you're working with the communities and with the bankers and with the technologists. How do you link this world together? Where do you see it? Zoom. Where do you see it <laughs> coming, <laughs> coming together? <laughs> Zoom, yeah, well, okay. Um, <laughs> look, I think, uh, you know, I've noticed one of the questions that popped up on the screen is asking about communities. And I think we have to start with communities because these are the people who live, in our case, next to us as neighbours. They don't live in our forest, but they're our neighbours. Um, so part of what we, we, we have done is, of course, consult the communities extensively on what their life plans are, what their objectives are, what they'd like to achieve. And a lot, one of the top objectives for our communities actually was the elimination of illegal hunting. Mm. Now, what we see in Peru is we, see, we can see them, they're horrible, boats full of dead mammals which have been illegally hunted from lands either owned by the communities or next door to the communities. And this is having uh, clearly having a big impact on uh, you know, knock-on impact. So the very shy jaguar, for example, would have eaten some of that stuff themselves. And the, and the not-so-shy communities would like to eat it too. So actually, you know, we're putting in place with our regular uh, patrol boats and so forth, it, 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 it helps mitigate the risk that hunters will focus on our part of the forest to go and hunt. Mm. Now, actually, we'd like to track that. You know, we're very keen on tracking it. I'm absolutely certain Stephanie will tell me that she can do it. And that this is where I think we, we, we bring in um, you know, the needs of local people, technology, and actually the needs of, of, of bankers and investors are, if you like, the same but completely in reverse. They don't want to buy into carbon from a project that isn't delivering multiple other benefits and can't be verified. Um, so so we've, we've worked really hard on trying to address, alongside our forest management, biodiversity, as I've, I'll talk all day about, um, and then also community development as well. It's mm. really important, and that's what's, it's a mark of quality which is, is needed in the marketplace because you, the last thing you want is for, I'll name him, Red Plus Monitor to say XYZ <laughs> Bank has you know, bought Jewish, credits Jewish, from this, Jewish. this project, <laughs> and boom, <laughs> you don't want that. And Julian, keeping it, keeping it concrete, um, can you give, me, give an example of a project that you're doing where you're doing that dashboard and how it, what it looks like? And we've got a question here about standards. You know, how does it fit with the global standards like Gold Standard and Vera and so on? Mm. You know, yeah. these, these practical um, things that we're monitoring with communities on the ground, how do they fit up into these global, global standards? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I mean, for us, one of the, the initial projects we would, we, would, uh, we would apply that to is some of the projects where we have maybe the best track record in terms of also understanding where we know more about the project already. So to see, okay, how do we fit the dashboard or such newer solutions and the different approaches we see here um, how do we, we connect that so that we can take it from there and now we are working on the first basically new projects to apply that to, uh, especially also actually from more an investment side rather than a carbon certification side. Mm -hmm. And I think it, to answer also the, the, the certification question, that also on the corporate side, I think we do see that more and more the, I would say, maybe the more um, experienced uh, investors in this in the space they are basically saying well the certification is just like the basis right so that's where we start mm. uh, but it's not at all saying well if you have that certification uh, that's where the ambition ends i think they have their own criteria they have fairly clear due diligence they are very clear about okay in additionality we want to see the following that goes beyond what the standards are actually requiring and we see it very similarly in the biodiversity space. And this is where then we can bring those solutions because again, 
the connection between the two sides is, is what is so crucial. Um, and not just coming at it with a it's a nice it's a nice front end for the investor who can sit in their office and click on the numbers and pull out a nice PDF report, which is important. I'm not denying that at all, but to also spin that back to the project, right? So and that's where we now see it the first times where we're applying it, for example, in, in projects in Mexico. Um, from the very early stage to also work with the baseline. And then we can actually go over the years and see, okay, this is how we are improving. And this yeah. is maybe in one area we're trying this, in the other area we're trying that, and we actually see what works better, right? Yeah. So it's not just there are 400 species, but next time there are maybe 410 in one and 470 in the other. So that's an important journey. And I think then to have those different aspects in the dashboard is uh, so relevant. It's interesting, isn't it? Because it starts to create a race to the top. You know, okay, we can do carbon, but let's do biodiversity, let's add that on, let's take out, let's remove poaching out of the picture, uh, and so on. And you can, you, you can, you can build much more interesting uh, stories that corporates and governments can, and communities can tell. Stephanie. Nature metrics is, I mean, it's exploding, isn't it? You've, you've got extraordinary demand. Um, who, who are you working with? What's the range of organizations and what are they asking for? Um, what's the market look like at the moment? So as a company, we work with, I wouldn't say everyone everywhere, but we work across the globe, I would say, <clears throat> potentially in 80 countries. Um, as I said before, we have people dedicated to working with the extractive, so the infrastructure sector, where the requirement for biodiversity reportings are much more clear. It's more about biodiversity impact assessments. We have even worked with large companies where we have developed specific digital products for them in integrating it with earth observation. But in my sector, as I said, I lead on uh, carbon markets and nature-based solutions. And the people I work with is like basically the people who are here. So this is a very good representation of the people I work with. So once someone asked me that same question and I thought about it and um, my parents used to work in Formula One, so I can only compare it to the preliminary... Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm a bad comment. <laughs> my parents love me. You're making um, up for all those carbon yes, emissions, exactly, though. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a bit like the preliminary um, races to kind of uh, get to the pole position, to get the best pole position. So it's people maybe like Julian. Julian actually should be your client, but he isn't yet. Oh, okay. So the very ambitious <laughs> ones, who are even more ambitious than Julian, they would come and say, okay, we really get it. We need to do biodiversity. How do we do it? Then this thing comes into place, like, okay, Vera, CCB, they don't ask us for much. It's sort of pretty low key at the moment, but they're determined to do more, right? They also know that something more is going to be on the horizon and they don't want to lose out on the opportunity. So if someone's now starting a land-based project, um, that could be a restoration project where you're going to start an intervention that you want to track, where you want mm. to track the success, or even a Red Plus project. You need to get your biodiversity baseline at the beginning, not when you've already started. That's kind of a no-brainer, right? So at this point, they come to us and say, how do we do this? So we don't know exactly how some of you are going to shape those market mechanisms. So we've now actually created some dedicated teams of bioinformaticians, statisticians. Um, we've got a team called Nature Intelligence Team. And we sit together and we try to figure out not just how the DNA part works, but from the ecological survey point of view, how do we need to distribute our sample points? What sampling intensity do we need to be able to get the granularity that you might need in the future, you know, especially when we're talking about markets. So there's things, considerations such as how can you detect and track changes in biodiversity that is actually attributable to your project mm. and it, you can actually deduct things like climate change. So this is all the thinking that goes into that and Again, we can work with a large corporation doing a Red Plus project. We can work with estates, 600 square meters. The Red Plus projects might be 200,000 square meters. Mm. And at the moment, it's still quite bespoke. Um, a lot of the clients don't really know exactly what they want. So it's a very exciting game at the moment. And more and more, we see clients who have done that research and really know what they want. And that's super fascinating. And it gives the possibility for some real scale, doesn't it? I mean, yes. the conservation world 
has to send biologists out and cover a lot of territory, and even then, it, you, know, take, you don't get very far for the, for the money. Now, you can, you can do entire river catchments with just a few water testing kits, and, and school kids can do it. Well, um, that's an oversimplification. Maybe, well, yes, yeah. school kids can <laughs> do it. But, but if, the, the thing is, what you have to take into account is, it, again, it depends on the data granularity. If someone says, I want biodiversity data, I want to combine them with Murray's data, I want to feed them into your platform, um, or onto your, I want to get the data onto your balance sheets, then you need to come to us and say, what kind of data do you need? How good do you need the data need to be? And how verifiable, auditable, etc. So if someone just wants a scoping exercise of, let's say, I have this piece of land, this river, I just want to see what's there to steer my future interventions or my future surveys, you can get away with relatively few samples. And yes, you could use school children if you want to go into child labor, but we don't Ooh, really support yes, that, right? <laughs> okay, to return the favor. Yes, folks. Yes. <laughs> um, but yes, that's true. We do not need ecologists because we take the samples with these kits. It's a bit like in times of COVID testing where you get everything you need delivered to your house and then you send it back and we do the difficult part, right? right? right. So that's true. But again, if you're looking to participate into biodiversity markets with any method you want to use, and that includes probably remote sensing, the more detail you want on your data, the more the cost rises. And we're now at the moment doing in Brazil, we're looking to do some testing to figure out what is the sweet spot between sampling intensity as in cost and the confidence level of mm. detection. So, I mean, we're being approached by councils in Australia who want to protect a million hectares of forest to ensure koala migration uh, uh, corridors as, as um, climate change hits. Uh, you, can, you could measure koala existence using this technology, couldn't you? Whether you have koalas in an area or not. Yes, uh, for koalas specifically, they're, they're, they're vertebrates. Are they? Yes, the virtual. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke, that was a joke, right? Um, we do need the presence of water. Yep. Yeah, because we, we, we have been testing, detecting mammals from soil, but only if we're really confident that we can get good data. Um, but it can be the integration of all these technologies, yes, exactly. right? I mean, you're not going to say that biodiversity can be measured by remote sensing. I mean, yes, they, exactly. they, but different parts of the challenge can be addressed with different technologies. Yes. So like field sampling or camera trapping might be more useful in other contexts, right? So, But yes, but, but it's possible. But yeah. again, as you say, depending on the circumstances, you can then figure out what's the best kind of basket of tools. So we would be sort of a, a broad brush first. And then if you wanted a census, you could look at other techniques. And then, of course, um, for the habitat information, for example, what Murray is doing would be essential, and then you bring those data together. But yes, we could do it. So Murray, pulling all of this together, your technologies, Julian's dashboards, the eDNA, the banker's screens, how, what does that all look like? Yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, we've got uh, this enormous challenge, or uh, polycrisis as you framed it, but I think we've got now a lot of the key pieces in place that we need to address these challenges. So, uh, for instance, we could look at biodiversity in our field sites, and we do do that to a certain extent using things like uh, forest plots. But what we're looking to do strategically is work with the right partners so we can deliver this more quickly. So we've had great conversations with Nature Metrics about working mm. in Gabon, for instance, yep. where we're doing the above ground biomass assessments, so fully calibrated, validated assessment uh, for a particular landscape. But we can also then bring in information about the biodiversity of the region, set a baseline against which you can measure the change, an econometrician can measure the impact in the future, and then we need to put it through uh, dashboards which make that information readily digestible and make sure that people are, uh, have trust in that data as well. So that's why we emphasize the scientific underpinning uh, of what we do uh, and produce research papers which show the, the credibility of how we approach these challenges. And only then, I think, can it be uh, presented to people in the financial services industry and to develop these novel financial instruments. So I think um, what we're seeing now, it is really exciting to look at the new technological developments, but I think now that the trick is to start integrating these and let the, these approaches mature and generate trust in the market. And in fact, that's what this group of people is so critical for, is exactly. coming to a global consensus on how these different pieces fit together. So there's a lot of work still to be done. We're running out of time. Questions? 
Yes. He does it to me every time. Every time, Yoss. <laughs> Give a girl some warning. And then we'll go to one, one online and maybe one more yeah. down there in the blue, blue shirt at the back. Yeah, yeah quickly, uh, uh, Jos Lemons from National Capital Consulting. And I would like to, to look into the future a little bit, right? So very exciting, uh, all these uh, new and, 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 and existing um, uh, technologies uh, to measure this and bring the, the perspective of an institutional investor. In it, right? Institutional investors, they invest in lots of stuff, right? They can know the geolocation of their investment, whether it's infrastructure or, or forest or, or, or things like that. But usually, they invest in listed equity, right? And when I talk to them about, um, about biodiversity risk, that they, say, that they know one thing, they will need to report on it. But for the remainder, I get blank stares, right? Because they invest in listed equity, you know, uh, a, 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 I don't know, a, a producer of commodities might know his first step in, um, in the value chain and might report on that if you're lucky. But then nobody knows, right? So, so how could, in future, uh, your um, uh, technologies help in marrying Locality, so biodiversity, risk, etc., ecosystems with ownership. Mm -hmm. right? there, there are some things that are being done, but you, you can't get it from the farmer to the eventual user uh, in some yeah. other context. Okay. So, well, I think yeah, can we do, well, you could probably address that very, very quickly by saying that with uh, pre computed data sets across large regions, where, for instance, we've done land cover mapping, land cover change detection, and perhaps integrated some uh, field level observations from eDNA, you then have a, a picture of what's happening in a region, patterns and processes. The gap then is uh, linking an individual investee company with the investment on the ground, and that's a sort of joining the dots entities. We've got some partners we're speaking to on that particular challenge, and you're also sitting next to Dr. Alexis Moyer, who's our head of spatial <laughs> finance at Space Intelligence, so I suggest you have a chat with her uh, as well. But I think we can produce use pre-computed data sets over the longer term, and then those can be called via an, an API or even a point and click on a website um, when we've joined the, debts, the dots with the MVSD companies. But that, that is a, a real gap. Do you want to say anything more on that? Um, I don't know really if I can add anything because definitely that's something that's in the future and definitely that's something where we need to um, team up with other companies to do that. That's not something that we can <clears throat> tackle by ourselves. The thing we can do, as I keep repeating, is we can just make sure that we work with all the different stakeholders across the supply chains to make sure that we can create the data and the data quality that is needed to make these things happen. And we do, obviously, also at Nature Metrics, we're part of a lot of different uh, consortiums of bigger groups where we work on these things together. Um, so we even have a philanthropic um, initiative called BioAtlas as well, for example, where we're creating a skeleton of biodiversity data across the whole globe. So these are things that are slowly happening and it definitely will be the way forward. So we have one more question yeah. on the back. Thanks very much. Um, I work in regenerative agriculture um, combined with solar development. Um, so I'm just wondering for future asset, natural asset managers, What's the advice in terms of um, lots of different potential markets, route to markets emerging over the next five or 10 years? Would you suggest collect the data, baseline sites, assets, and then sort of remain agnostic until um, but the you know, applicable markets emerge? Um, I'm just wondering kind of what you would advise on that. Who would like to take that? I can say something with clicky. I'm, I'm not an expert in your particular field, but this is a question that comes up quite often. Um, yes, I would say that I at least in land-based projects, yes, you do need to gather, collect the samples from our side at least, right? Then you have them. With Nature Metrics, at least, we have the uh, opportunity to store the samples for a year. So what some clients are choosing to do is they... Um, they take the samples, and again, we advise on sort of the most future-proof way of sampling, and then they might um, choose to just run one analysis, 
because they don't know whether they're going to need all of the different animal taxa or not. And then later on, we can revisit these samples and reanalyze them. So that kind of gives you a bit of that flexibility. But yes, of course, if you start a project where you're going to change something on your land, then you do need to take the, the baseline at the time zero. Stuart, Stuart I'll, last, so, last so I'll, I'll add to that. Um, I mean, absolutely right. Get your baselines first, because that's where you're going to start from. Um, and of course, some of the markets which we've been describing abstractly here don't exist at all today. Um, so my, 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 my advice to someone would be, when you sell one of your commodities, solar energy, carbon, whatever you're selling, make sure that contractually you haven't sold something else alongside it because there will be a market for it in future. So I think we need to look at contracts as well in this, in this perspective. And to your, to, sorry, if I just add on, on portfolios of biodiversity risk, you're in a very similar situation to the one I described this morning, which is Oxford University has got supply chains all over the place. And they did analysis on it and they figured out one and a half species loss per year due to their activities. They won't be able to tell you which one it is at all. But you don't have to. If you, if you select, for example, a tree, come and talk to me on my BGCI hat, we can conserve that for you. It's going to cost you about $250,000 per species. And actually, the species impact of a tree is much more than one. So I think we have to stop being specific about this particular company has you know, half destroyed half of this and half of that. Right? We just have to start accumulating together and create a market where one can say, I have an equity portfolio of a, a billion euros, I think the, the species loss uh, risk in my $1 billion equity portfolio is five, and I've mitigated that risk by taking these specific actions. No, it's not like a carbon credit. So it's, it's what you're doing is you're, you're, you can we can tell you which the most at-risk species are. So someone has to say them, otherwise they're gonna go. You can do it. So that, that's how you can mitigate risk in your portfolio. It's not, I have carefully not used the word offset because if you're destroying a species, you ought to stop doing that. And what, what we see developing here is a world of multiple credits and that's actually where gold standard is going. They're, they're going to be requiring more than, more than three results in their projects, carbon, biodiversity, gender, water, and so on, at least three. This is starting to move towards a poly solution. You see here, not quite a poly solution, but we've got a lot of pieces starting to come together. We've got a lot to solve still. We've got to have a standard, of a global standard on biodiversity that we can all apply. We have to work out how to link the platforms together, how to get them simple enough for the bankers, the, the communities I'm not worried about, and how to, how to make this whole, whole world, world plug into the, to the financial markets. But I think you can see there's rapid evolution going on and stay tuned when we come back in to the next conference. I'm sure that things will be quite a bit different. A big thank you to our panelists and thank you to you all. Um, this is Transforming Technology. <laughs>